it's challenging to go to the UN and participate in the system where the UN says, you know, we have this formula and every country gets to have a certain amount of people get jobs at the UN. So they look at the formula and they say, oh, well, how many people do we have from Nigeria? Oh, we need more. Go hire people into the system from Nigeria. It tends to not be whether or not someone is qualified mm -hmm. or has the skill set. It is, are we being fair and equal on the disbursement of jobs? We're hearing that's, a lot of this idea lately, all over right. the place. And that's where it breaks down yeah. because you're hiring people that really don't know what they're doing and they waste money and the UN becomes a jobs program. Can you talk a little bit about just generally what the state of the UN is and what it was like to be there? And you know that so many people think that it's like this sort of perfect thing that the Ooh. countries come together and figure out what's right for everybody. Like they love the idea of it more than yeah. I think functionally how it works right. or does not work. Well, first of all, the uh, I always try to correct people that, that the UN doesn't really exist. The UN is member states. Right, so when somebody says, oh, the UN says no, I always say, the UN doesn't say no. Members at the UN, maybe Russia and China got together in the Security mm -hmm. Council and said no, but the UN doesn't take a position. And so I, I try to not just reflexively blame, oh, the UN, the UN. stopped something, because it's really member countries, that's mm -hmm. the first thing. The second thing is, is the UN does not work unless the US is leading it, whether it's the World Food Program, UNICEF, UNDP, you know, the development programs, whatever it is, the US has to be there, otherwise the UN does not work. The UN system is based on every country is equal, not every person is equal, it's every country. And that's where I think as Americans we say, that's just fundamentally not true. Mm -hmm. Every country is not equal. So in the General Assembly, when we pretend that these small island countries get the same vote as China, or the United States, or the, you know, the bigger economies, um, that's kind of laughable, to be honest. I get that we wanna have a General Assembly where people have the ability to talk, but I don't love the idea of one country, one vote, um, which I think is balanced by the Security Council and the, and the idea that the substantive work goes to the Security Council. So I get the kind of separation. Um, but it's challenging to go to the UN and participate in the system where the UN says, you know, we have this formula and every country gets to have a certain amount of people get jobs at the UN. So they look at the formula and they say, oh, well, how many people do we have from Nigeria? Oh, we need more. Go hire people into the system from Nigeria. It tends to not be whether or not someone is qualified mm -hmm. or has the skill set. It is, are we being fair and equal on the disbursement of jobs? We're hearing that's, a lot of this idea lately, all over right. the place. And that's where it breaks down, yeah. because you're hiring people that really don't know what they're doing and they waste money and the UN becomes a jobs program. Is the UN better at certain things and worse at others? So like when it comes to food disbursement or helping development, that kind of stuff, it seems like they're probably pretty decent at. And then the Security Council or a lot of the rest of it seems like 90% of it is just voting against Israel for, yeah, you know, yeah, moving, for sure. moving to Iraq. <laughs> um, yeah, I think you hit it on the head is that, you know, we pay 25% of the UN bill and that's for the Secretariat and the kind of UN administration. And all the parking tickets, right? Isn't, yeah, the, isn't the whole thing just parking tickets? <laughs> exactly. Isn't that what they say? It's just ambassadors. You just, get to park wherever you want. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, there are these what they call um, uh, extra bodies, independent bodies. And those are funded through voluntary contributions. So World Food Program and UNICEF, they don't get monies from the, the general fund of the 25% money that we give. UNICEF only gets its budget by appealing to people say, to say, we've got a crisis, we need to go out and who, who wants to write us a check? The Europeans, the Germans, the Americans. We fund the most on those uh, World Food Program, UNICEF type uh, independent bodies. That's why they're the well run, is mm -hmm. because we demand management, transparency, and, and accountability in these independent bodies. We don't have that ability to do in the UN General Assembly. So the you get this kind of really blob type uh, management and, and mission 
from the actual UN operations. What is the obsession with Israel, with the General Assembly? I mean, every, every time you look at that chart, it's like 90% yeah. of the condemnations and- Well, you know that there's the only actions. one country that can't serve on the Security Council, and that's Israel. I'm outraged by it. I'm telling you, I think that, that the US government should just put its foot down and say, we're gonna clear the deck and Israel should be on the Security Council, just to prove a point of, of, of getting them on the, on the Security Council. Um, it, there's this fascination with condemning Israel. It's why we got out of the Human Rights Council is because you know, you've know you got nine resolutions on Israel and nothing on you know, Iran or, or, I mean, the word is out. If you, if you don't wanna be condemned by the UN and you're a human rights abuser, then go run for the Human <laughs> Rights Council so you can protect yourself. Right. Trump somehow just gets all this? Like he really has fixed a lot of this. Or is in the process of fixing it or You know, he's like not that. of the political establishment. And so he's willing to be a disruptor. We all know about disruptive technology and people who go in and say, gosh, everybody has groupthink and you're missing the big, you know, reform effort. I think Americans really want Washington to be disrupted or the UN. They they look at it and they say, What a waste. You know, why are we spending all that money? But the system in Washington filled with lobbyists and, and all the people that take care of each other, they don't want an outsider coming in and somehow wrecking their good fortune. You know, and, and we see that in Hollywood. We see that same thing in Hollywood. And so I, I want to, to applaud and do everything I can for President Trump because first of all, he's got really thick skin. All of the people who just constantly come at him for, thank God we got a president who's just really tough on that and doesn't care. And two, he sees it for what it is and he's not really that partisan. I mean, I look at what I'm starting to, to call the Trump doctrine, which I think is the Trump doctrine to foreign policy, which is a dual approach to every single issue where you use every tool of the US government, economic tool, sanctions, pressure, to change the behavior of a country. And you really utilize that pressure in a strong way. At the same time, there's this separate path to say, let's talk. Let's sit down and have a diplomatic talk. He's doing it with Kim Jong-un. Mm -hmm. And the, the neocons and the traditional Republicans did not like him saying, I'm gonna go just go talk to Kim Jong-un. They only wanna do the squeezing. Mm -hmm. They don't always wanna say, well, why not talk to see if we can test this? Talking is a tactic. It's not, it's not the goal, So right? when, you see the, when you see then like the never Trump conservatives, so like the Bill Crystals or just those guys that have sort of been around forever and who usually have gotten everything wrong always, are they different privately? Like are they privately kind of like, yeah, I like what he's doing and he's I doing I don't think more. so. I think you they're think creatures of Washington. I think yeah. they live in Washington, D.C. and they, they, they want people to play by the rules. The people who benefit from the rules and, and they want everybody to come in and play by the rules are... Uh, on both sides of the aisle. This is not a partisan thing at all. It's you gotta come to our city and play by our rules because we got lobbyists to take care of and we've got a system and everybody is participating in the system. Right. Marco Rubio actually uh, talked about this just the other day and I thought it was really good. He, he was saying, look, when I came to Washington and I didn't go to their cocktail parties, I eventually didn't get invited to their cocktail parties and then they started sniping at me because I wasn't going to their cocktail parties and, I, and they recognized that I wasn't playing by their rules. And he said, Trump has done it tenfold. Mm -hmm. he, he's come in and, and you know, completely uh, doubled down on that. And, and I think it's right. I think we're getting senators, you know, Ron Johnson, I think, is another great senator who, who doesn't play that game. And he, he comes from Wisconsin and, and plays a, a different you know, tune, which is I'm fighting for the people of Wisconsin. Marco Rubio, I think, is doing that. that we have senators that are beginning to do that and challenge the system uh, and I think it's what the people want. Uh, so what's it like when Trump, Donald Trump, New York businessman Donald Trump, the guy becomes president, then I assume your phone rings one day and he says, uh, <laughs> looking, looking to send somebody over to Germany? Is it a phone call? Is it an email? Does someone else reach out to you first? How does that all work? Well, I, so I had been um, in and around the campaign quite a bit. And so there's always a constant conversation. Um, and there's also, I think, a question of like who's loyal, right? Who, who, who was here before 
all of the jobs were available, mm -hmm. um, who, who was committed, and I think they saw that I was very committed in, in the campaign. And so the conversation to me was, you know, where do you see yourself in the administration or do you want to join the administration? And so uh, from the beginning, I just said, you know, some sort of a foreign policy role, you know, let's, let's discuss. And, and then we had that conversation. And eventually I was like, I think Germany is a good fit. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about politics instead of nonstop yelling, check out our politics playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, watch our full episode playlist all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.